Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and welcome to a quick hands-on with the Default Engine. Now, the Default Engine was just released at the end of the Game Developer Conference of 2016. Uh, it's been in beta for a little while now, and it's a cool cross-platform, mobile-focused, Lua-powered, closed-source, free game engine. Now, let me start right off the hop, though, and get the 800-pound gorilla out of the way. It is from King. That King. You know, the King you're thinking of. Yep, it's them. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, King is a maker of many, many, many uh, mobile games. And they've done some very questionable things in the indie game space. I'm not going to get into it in full details, uh, but there have been some uh, bully lawsuits. Uh, there have been some allegations of cloning or stealing games wholesale from uh, indie developers, etc. So King's uh, reputation amongst the indie world is not the best out there. Um, however, in Default's um, favor, uh, I guess you could say, first off, King has recently been acquired by Activision, so we don't know if there's going to be a change of heart or a change of tactics there. And the Default engine actually started outside of King and has been run by a non-King or a King-acquired team the whole time. So it's somewhat separate to their main being. Now, some people are obviously going to sit back and say, well, this is just a Trojan horse for um, King to steal ideas from. And I'm not going to tell you that you're crazy for thinking that, uh, especially if you end up being right. Uh, but I honestly don't think that's the case. Though I do perfectly understand your concerns, especially when it is King we are dealing with here. Now, putting that aside, uh, the default engine actually looks really cool. So I'm going to show it to you regardless to the source it came from. Now, if it does end up being a Trojan horse, which again, I really doubt, well, you've been warned front. Uh, so uh, this is the default engine made available from King completely free. Now you're wondering about the completely free part. Uh, the way they explain it is basically by you guys banging on it, they use this in-house so it makes their own tools better. Also they say to some degree this is to increase goodwill in the indie developer community, which by the fact that I have to start this video off with a disclaimer, I guess they could definitely use. Uh, now I did say it's closed source and it is now. Uh, you also run your projects on their server as we'll see shortly but from the default developers, they said that uh, version 2.0 is in the works and it will hopefully remove that server requirement so you can work on your own particular version. I've also heard that you can host uh, behind the scenes they're using GitHub for projects. Apparently, you can hook up your own repository uh, externally, so if you don't want to use their particular servers, but you're still running it through their servers. But that does give us some advantages, as it gives us the ability to collaborate, do team-based stuff, etc. All right, so that's the uh, preamble. Let's jump right in. Now, to get the default engine, just head over to www.default.com and click the predictable enough, get default. Let's see if they fix this. Uh, yeah, it fits now. Uh, if you're on a high DPI screen, this may actually scroll off your screen, which it did for me. Uh, but you need a Google Google account to sign in. I just used mine. It didn't ask for some outrageous permissions, so uh, I'm okay with that uh, particular set of requirements. But again, if you don't want them having your email address, uh, that is going to be required here. Uh, so once you've actually got your account created, you come on into the dashboard. This is the main dashboard. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Still the main dashboard. It will ultimately bring you here or something that looks somewhat like here. And you pick to um, download the editor uh, of your choice, so it's Mac, Windows, or Linux. And if you've ever used Eclipse, you're going to immediately recognize the tools. The tools are obviously based off the Eclipse source code. Uh, so um, same particular layout, same particular look, etc. Just go ahead and download. It comes down as a zip file, uh, which you then go ahead and extract. You'll see it is looking like so. And we'll go ahead and just pick default, and we'll go ahead and run that, and you'll see, again, this looks a whole lot like Eclipse. Now, nice thing is self-updating. Uh, so here is your dan standard project screen. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new project. And we'll create it from the default dashboard here, which you have to do, actually. So go ahead, add, de uh, add project. And I'll call this one YouTube Demo. Demo on YouTube. And instead of starting with a blank slate, we're actually going to use a, one of their tutorial setups. And I will use a uh, side scroller and save. So that went ahead and it created the project. You could hook up uh, the default analytics. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any cost to the analytics. I don't think there is, uh, but I'm just going to skip that for now. Uh, you could add to your team member so, you, uh, so people can, you know, you can collaborate with the team uh, and you can edit your settings. Now, I don't know where you go ahead and actually change the GitHub or if that's just a dream scenario, uh, but I would assume it was here. But if you want to get rid of your project, you can come and delete it here. So anyways, that is the extent of actually having to work with their dashboard other than to add new users and create projects. We're now done with that, so we're now in the editor. We'll just come on in here and go, 
open project. And this is by no means a tutorial, by the way. I, I don't have enough experience. I would even consider this a closer look at. I haven't used this engine enough to do much more than just show you the basics. So that's all this video is. Uh, so if I make mistakes, if I don't fully understand things, understand that is why. This is pretty new to me. I just wanted to give you a heads up. So uh, there's the project we just created. I'll go ahead and open that up. And GitHub behind the scenes, we're basically forking a new branch. Uh, branch 1. And now it's downloading all of the data from the servers. Now, of course, you're going to find if their servers are offline, you're going to have an issue, uh, which obviously is the problem with any server-based uh, solution. I believe once it's actually downloaded, though, uh, you can cut your connection and uh, continue to work. I don't know how much it goes back to the server for after the fact. So now it breaks down a number of files. The first one here, this is your project file. We can go ahead and open that up, and you get this nice handy editor. And if you've never used Eclipse before, it's about what you expect. Each one of these windows is completely configurable. Um, it's stripped down, so it doesn't have all the crap in it. This is a much more streamlined experience than Eclipse, uh, but you can do things like resize and reconfigure uh, so we can minimize and maximize each particular view, or you can grab things by the tab, uh, drag them to whatever location you want, or you can dock them into other tabs like so. Uh, so it's an infinitely configurable editor and editing experience, which is definitely a nice way to go about things. So that is uh, game settings. You can see your particular edited files are tabbed across the top, uh, and it's broken down into here's like the basic things that go together to create this game. So here you can see, for example, an atlas. An atlas is, you see all these PNG files? Now interestingly, there's no editor. So if you click a PNG file, you're actually getting the binary text of it. Seems like a missed opportunity. So I'm shocked that there is no image viewer uh, for when you pick a, an image file. But you can see there's compiled the background stuff together into this folder. And you can see it's made up of scripts, Go, and Atlas. Now, an Atlas is a sprite sheet. It's all of these PNG files, these various different PNG files, packed together in a single Atlas. And you can see it right here. Context-sensitive editor comes up. Uh, so there are the various pieces that go together with it. Uh, if I can, so you can see here's the atlas and then the different uh, images within that atlas. Uh, so it's a way of pack, uh, it's packing these textures together in a 2048 by 1024 uh, file. If I go over to properties, I thought we'd get context sensitive pro Oh, oops, there we go. So you can set the uh, particular properties for this atlas. Let me just open this guy up a little bit. So you can see. Uh, the various little path, name, size, etc. Uh, so an atlas is basically just a texture atlas. We can go ahead, we can add new things to it. Uh, I think, no, I can create things there. Uh, so I add to the atlas, I think, just by drag. Woohoo! I thought that's how you did it. Guess it's not. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the, the one here that's actually probably the most important, however, is this .geo. Now, geo stands for game objects, and essentially this is how uh, your things are bundled together. So you can see a game object here consists of these five sprites, and the sprite themselves, if I, can I actually get the properties of that sprite? No, I have to get them. Uh, where do those sprites actually come from? Well, anyways, uh, so again, I'm stumbling over this as I learn it. So the particular ins and outs of the interface, uh, I'm going to get to in time. So ex excuse my awkwardness as I go. But you'll notice there's the uh, assets that go together to make this uh, large clouds game object. But you'll notice also that there's this script here. I'll open up the script, and you can see here's some simple little code uh, that is called uh, during the game's update uh, phase. So basically every pass of the game through game's loop, this update function is called. And it does this particular code. So you can see apply speed, resets cloud, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so this is how your infinitely scrolling background is being implemented. So we also see we have another game object down here for small clouds. And we can see it in turn has them. And it has slightly different. Uh, let's see, what's the actual difference? Times two. All right. So just slightly different code. But basically, they're just multiplying the, the move amount by two uh, for the smaller stuff. Uh, so it's moving at a fixed rate. But you can see, so basically game objects are a collection of assets, like, like these sprites, and then scripts. And we get in, we can actually get into slightly more complicated. Let's go spaceship. Spaceship will have a game object. So you can see up here, we've got these 10 frames that go into creating, or 9 frames that go into creating the spaceship. The X, the Atlas, which is the, has an animation called spin, composed of those particular 9 frames, as we can see drawn out here. 
the game object, which contains a script, the sprite, and a collision object, which is a sphere uh, for doing collisions against it. Uh, so you can think of uh, the game objects are somewhat like uh, prefabs from Unity, I suppose, are um, game, uh, the cross between game object and prefab, I guess. Uh, we go into our main here, we can see the same thing again. So main is another game object, and you'll see your, your main game script, once again, is implementing uh, your update, init, uh, so basically different callbacks that are called during the program's life cycle. And then it does whatever. Now another th key thing here, and I'm not actually sure I like this to be honest, is this messaging system. So this is a way of passing events. Uh, so message.post, and then you can see it's also receiving messages. I'm not doing anything with them, uh, but everything can be communicate with each other using string-based messages. So it's the render and clear color as a parameter, etc. I don't like this a lot of the times because it decouples code, and that's exactly why you do it. That way you don't have to have tight coupling between different things. Unfortunately, it makes sort of this meta-programming language. I don't know what the messages are. If there's an error there, the compiler can't tell me. Um, it can create some really ugly code, as anybody that's done a lot of Unity developing, which uses the same send message type approach. It's not my favorite approach to things, but it is a flexible, quick one. So it's, it's a trade-off if you like it or you don't, uh, but you'll find that uh, the default engine is heavily message-based. Uh, and if you're going to get away with that crap, you have to have good um, documentation, which we will get to in a second. Now, another thing you'll see here is collection. And a collection is, there you go. Uh, you can think of a collection almost like uh, a level or a scene or, um, but it's made up of, you know, all these different things. So we saw the large clouds, uh, the small clouds, two instances of it, uh, the spaceship, etc. So it's bringing them all together. Now you got to keep in mind each one of these things. So once again, let's go back to small clouds. Uh, where was that? Da, 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 da. Small clouds. So, so small clouds in turn has its own code. So this is how you break things up. So your collection is basically what brings all of these things in. Uh, you've also got factory objects like this guy, which is a star fact that doesn't actually go to anything. Where is that? Come on, the stars. Uh, factory script. And then here you got this code that's called as part of the factory. There's your factory collection, which brought it in, and then here, yeah, there's your script back. Uh, so it's a very clean layout. There's a bunch of tools hidden in behind the scenes here too. Like for example, we've got font support. So here's a font object. Uh, it's brought in the various properties for a font. You can see the uh, the image that's being used, and of course here's the TTF file that actually brought it all to happen. Uh, that's just in the Windows editor, by the way. Uh, so you can bring in fonts as TTF files. Another thing we can do is input. Uh, so like here, if you've used, uh, let's see who all does this. I think Unity does it, Unreal Engine does it, uh, Project Anarchy does it. It's very common in game engines. But basically you're creating keyboard maps or trigger maps, so it comes back. So uh, here's key. So we've defined a key trigger as zero. So come back here, we see it. So you can handle this one. You can handle this as opposed to the actual key. So you're mapping uh, key trigger zero to key up. And the action is up. So on, on key up, so when you press the up key, the up action is fired. And then we see here, gamepad lpad up, the up action is fired. So it gives you a way to support multiple input devices using the same logic consisted one set of code. Uh, on top of that, uh, if we go back again, let's get rid of all the use stuff. You'll notice if I right click here and go to new. Uh, so we've seen atlases, that's your collection of sprites. Uh, camera file, no idea what that actually is. Uh, collection factory, collection file. So collections we saw basically can be can thought of as uh, scenes, I guess, would probably be the closest parallel. Or, But I guess it doesn't have to be actually visible. But uh, So collection is a good name, but it is the analog to a scene in like Godot or Unity, etc. Uh, you have factories, you have fonts, we just saw game objects we've seen pretty consistently. These are the entities that compose your world. Uh, your GUI file, which is actually kind of cool. Let's see if I've got one. I think there's one in main. So, yep, here we go. Uh, so, a bit of a simple GUI editor built in here. You can see over here, we got our various nodes, such as uh, the score here. It's a text field. I think I can add stuff here so we can add uh, the different things that go together to make your UI. Uh, you can change your layout from landscape to portrait. Uh, so we can add textures in, uh, text boxes, text, uh, pie, uh, etc. So there is a GUI editor built in there, and of course you can tie that into this GUI script, uh, which is the code that handles the GUI events, or main script, and so on. And once again, 
It's all this message stuff, and I'm not, again, a huge fan of that. So actually, was there any messaging in here? Yep. So here you can see it's actually on message, so this uh, UI script is looking for the message for add score and then responding accordingly. Now, I, you may like this as a mechanism of communication. I understand why they went with it, but it's personally not always my absolute favorite. And that is essentially the editor that you're dealing with. So you got a nice world placement editor. You can build things into collections. You can uh, organize things nicely. There are the tools in there to bring in the various assets you need. Um, so I didn't keep going. Your input binding we saw earlier, lights, Lua, module file, uh, material file, models for bringing in 3D models. Actually, let's try and bring one. Um, yeah, let's actually create, I haven't done this before, so let's go ahead and create a new folder, call it model test, and let's see what actually, hey, where'd you go? Did I just make that in something else? Yes, I did. Ooh, that's not intuitive. I actually think that is a hangover from, oh hell, I'll just leave it, ooh, I think I just moved it. All right, so inside a model test, we shall go ahead and try create a model, new model dot model. Okay, no idea how to import a model, something I'll have to look at later. So I don't know what format they are. Uh, I believe you can bring in probably FBX. It's in the documentation. I can look at that in a second when I cover the documentation. Uh, but anyways, there's a number of things obviously built in here. There's most of what you want. Uh, sp spine, uh, spine. oh yeah, um, the animation system, spine uh, integrated. Uh, sprites, uh, tile map for um, like tile to style uh, maps and tiles, the actual things you're going to use to draw your map. Uh, so most of what you actually need to create a game is here, tied into the editor. Uh, again, I need some more time hands-on to actually show you how to do these particular things. I'm not going to get into that. And the only thing I'm going to really cover here before we go on is, let's say, go back to... Uh, it was under backgrounds we started. Uh, so we dealt with this... Um, largeclouds.go. You see it's rendered right here. But with almost everything in here, you can actually right-click and open it instead with text. And you can see the file that composed it. So if you're more, if you don't want to work with this visual stuff, you can come in here and edit it this way if you prefer. Uh, so that is essentially the default editor, the default coding model, the code uh, way of doing things. Uh, it's quite clean. It's easy to learn. I imagine I could have a game up and going uh, this afternoon if I play around this a little bit more. You know, just the specifics. I have to figure out how to actually import a model, etc., uh, which leads us to actually learning how to use this. And here's where things get pretty impressive. Now, you'll notice as we've been going, let me just try and get here. So you've got uh, the hints that are coming up as we go. So you see uh, QW and R is a various manipulator. So QWR. Let's move, move rotate. What's, oh, Q is normally select. Hey, no scale. Hmm. So you can see, anyways, on the fly commands up here for the um, various. Uh, so that's a dot go. So we'll go into a dot script, and you see different documentation comes up here. And there's also these links. And those links are important. So we'll hit that one, and this is bringing us into the documentation. And for a brand new project, this documentation is stellar. Uh, to be honest, there's no coming soon, so there's no placeholders. It just is. It's here. It's ready to go, and it is. It's good documentation. It's very good documentation. This is one of the best documented engines, especially for day one, that I have ever seen. So uh, your documentation is very, very thorough. Uh, you can get down to, uh, you know, the various different things. So let's like, say uh, models there. So three engine behind the scenes, you can import a model and here's how you go about doing it. Uh, here's an example of using Blender and then actually step by step walking you through it. And then some code to manipulate the model. So as I was saying, this is a very well documented game engine. So that part is huge. And the other thing is, and this is one of those little pet peeves I've had uh, for a very long time, Unity and Unreal Engine can both do 2D but they are so overkill most of the time. And this is more focused. There's a 3D engine behind the scenes, and I like that. Uh, a 2D-only engine, you will often run into a point where you want to do something 3D. Behind the scenes of every game, just the way GPUs work these days, every 2D engine is 3D. And it's only presenting two of the Ds to you. Uh, a lot of times, though, you'll want to get to like 2.5D or 3D, but presented as 2D, something like uh, Bastion, for example. And working in a full-on 3D environment and faking 2D is painful, especially when you've got all these tools for shit. You don't sort of stuff you don't need. It's, it's 
It's such overkill a lot of times, and that's where the fold is very nice. It's very focused. It does what it does. It's there for making 2D focus games, but it has the 3D follow back. Uh, this is why I also like things like uh, LibGDX or Godot as my choices for uh, 2D development over the bigger guys like uh, Unreal or Unity or God help us, CryEngine, which is a huge mismatch for making just a simple 2D game. So if that's what you're looking to do, this is a great choice. Now, one thing, again, back to that message passing, here is their documentation. So you can actually come in and get uh, a good idea of what messages are available. Uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to actually uh, refer to it a lot because it's completely non-intuitive at times. But they are all there. So you can see there's your different different options, different things coming in. So that's what allows us to get away with that messaging type approach is it is well documented in here. At the same time, a very important thing to start with is apps, um, the application lifecycle. So you can actually see, remember those callbacks we were talking about earlier, things like uh, update or init? This shows the process things came in. But again, it is very, very, very well documented. Uh, very cleanly, uh, very good job, very presentable. So if you're looking for an initial engine. Like first off, um, I'm doing a beginner focus series in Lua and Love right now because I think Lua is one of the best uh, beginner focus languages out there. And this is a tool that is sh ideal for shipping commercial games, but it doesn't lose that ease of use. Uh, so it's a very powerful thing. It's definitely an engine I'm going to play around with a bit more, get to know a bit better. Another part that makes me happy is they have a good reference. And again, a good reference is the key to a happy marriage. Uh, it really is. Like it, it's uh, really ideal. Uh, if a project has a good reference but bad documentation, you can normally get away with that alone. If it's got bad, uh, if it's got good documentation but a bad reference, that's actually a bit worse. But in this case, it's got both, and that's great. And on top of that, there are some tutorials to get you up and going. Uh, we've already been we've been looking at the side scroller a bit, but it actually comes with step-by-step -step instruction on how things actually work, uh, how the various pieces fit together, etc. So this is an engine. If you can get over the whole king thing, go ahead and check it out. Uh, next up, we go back to the editor for just one more second. And you can see uh, right up here, uh, we've got the ability. Oh, first off, there's debugging. I don't actually know what their debugging functionality is. Not print. Ooh, not prints. Uh... Okay, so you can integrate into Zero Brain Studio, so that's nice. So you can actually have breakpoint debugging using Zero Brain. Uh, sorry, I was off on a tangent for myself. Uh, anyways, when you're in here, when you're done, you want to build your project. You can go ahead and build and launch, rebuild and launch, build for HTML, and come down here. We can bundle. You see, we can make a bundle for iOS, Android, OS X, Windows, Linux, or HTML5, or we can target. Oh, local platform. Uh, so basically, those are your supported. And to go ahead and create something, let's say an HTML5 application, just come on here, pick your folder, and you're good to go. And when you're ready to run it, just build and launch. See down here that it's building. Oh, and there's an error. I probably mucked something up. Oh, yeah, my mesh. I didn't provide a mesh. Oh, so that's how you add your mesh. Ah, easy enough. Uh, so let's go back to model test and just delete that. Away. All right, let's try that again. Build and launch. And there is our game running. I think it was up and down arrow. You know, I think you're supposed to collect the stars. So I'm not going to get to that one in time. And done. Uh, so that is the default engine. A very quick overview of it. Uh, in closing, I am really impressed. It's got great documentation. It's well polished. It works well. It's completely free. Uh, just know what the downsides are. Uh, the downsides are very obvious. It's king. It runs on their servers. And it's closed source. And those are really the only negatives. If, if those negatives are big negatives to you, obviously we're out of luck. Uh, but if they are not, uh, then I definitely recommend you check this out. Uh, it's performant. It works well. It's well documented. It's organized well. It's intuitive. Uh, the tools work well. Uh, even uh, I haven't tried team collaboration, but it seems to be something that this was built for from the ground up. Uh, versioning on their servers. Um, it's a great little engine. Uh, so uh, again, all comes down to that whole king thing. If that's a big deal, it's a big deal. If it's not, definitely check the fold out. Uh, so thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed that. See you all later.